founder of Avalon International Breads. If you haven't tried her, her products, she brought some, some bread and some cookies that are back there, so make sure you snag those. Um, she's the co-founder of Aver Avalon International Breads, a socially responsible artisan bakery that's been located in the Cass Corridor of Detroit since 1997. A suburban expatriate, Victor moved to Detroit after graduating from the University of Michigan in 1999 and then working up in Traverse City for a while. As, oh, 1988, sorry, wrong year. Um, I like it better though. <laughs> uh, Jackie's background in grassroots political organizing informs her innovative approach to marketing and business development. She's the proud mom, mother of two children and she's on the board of the Greening of Detroit and the Isaac Avery Downtown Synagogue. Jackie. get the timer on so I know exactly how I'm doing here. All right. Oops. Sorry. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, it is amazing to be here. I mean, I knew I've been thinking about this a lot. I'm really honored uh, to be here to address Local First. But what I didn't anticipate is how moved I would be. Now, I have to warn you, I'm a bit of a crier. Like, we go into movies, it doesn't matter what the movie is, and the kids are like, okay, please don't cry, like the loud cry. But um, I'm a bit of a crier. But I, at the last panel, which was on social equity, I really couldn't hold back the tears. I mean, the stories that I'm hearing today are really sincerely so moving, and the depth of the work that's going on here is what's really impressive to me. But, um, so I just, I, I'm really actually honored and quite humbled to be here hearing all um, really the very real work you all are doing. I'd like to thank Megan uh, for so patiently working with me these last few months and doing such a great job in making all the necessary arrangements and all the staff and the board of Local First. Um, I'm also excited to be in Grand Rapids and have an opportunity to hear, uh, to see this city that I'm hearing so many great things about and now I have to come back and eat for three days because everyone keeps saying, are you going to eat there? Are you going to eat there? It just sounds like there's so much amazing food. I have to make a food trip back here. When Megan first told me that Local First had 600 businesses, I literally thought that I misheard. Like 600 businesses? I mean, that, I hope you guys realize what an amazing tribute that is to your shared vision, to your shared values, to your work ethic and your commitment to living a life bigger than yourselves. And I live in Detroit, the biggest city in the state. We don't even have a local business organization, much less of 600 members. So it's really great what you have here. And I'd like to give yourself a little hand for doing what you do. And it's all well and good. It's all nice and kumbaya, but it's also really good business. By banding together, you can use your resources to make all of you better, more competitive businesses and leverage access to assets, goods and services that you wouldn't be able to access on your own. And this is how you'll stay competitive in the face of big box businesses. And this is, these relationships are also how you're gonna make your businesses more sustainable for yourselves. So I spent some time in Grand Rapids about 20 years ago. And um, I'm thinking a lot of you might be a little young to remember this, but I was on something called the Michigan Peace March. Does anyone? They got nothing. Okay. Well, um, in the summer of 1985, anywhere from 20 to 200 of us walked from Mackinac Island to Detroit for three months. And we were talking about uh, military, nuclear disarmament and social justice. I don't know that we really slowed down the nuclear arms race, but we did weave together an amazing community that exists to this day. And in some ways, I think it's the seeds of the community that's here and in Detroit. So it's very gratifying to be here 20 years later, talking to a group of like-minded entrepreneurs who are working together for an equally lofty goal. So creating a just and sustainable world by creating a just and sustainable business. Pretty lofty. But I'm not here to tell you now especially that I've heard these panels, I'm not here to tell you anything you don't already know. What I'm here to do is share my story with you. Hopefully, I can inspire you a little bit, but mostly what I wanna do 
is remind you of your own truths. Mostly, you know everything I'm gonna say, and I think a lot of times we just all need the confidence to just blow forward and do what we know is right. I hope that in doing this, I can help make you a little more effective as business owners and also as agents of social change. So looking back on Avalon's 15 year history, um, I didn't graduate from college in 97. I started the bakery in 97, but it would have been nice if I graduated college in 97. Um, but I'd like to share three principles with you that have helped us create a just and sustainable business that I hope is helping to create a just and sustainable world. So these three principles of sustainable business are vision, values, and evaluation. I tried to make it three V's, but it's kind of two V's and an E. So vision, what's a vision? So a vision is the specific way that your business fits into the whole. Your vision is the thing you see at night when you're almost asleep, but not quite. The vision is the thing that no matter what happens, nobody can, can convince you of otherwise. The vision is probably the place that you never reach, and it's the thing that doesn't exist yet. Your vision can also be written and rewritten, because um, it's never quite attainable, but you're always getting closer. The vision is the reason you're here. The vision is your North Star. So the Avalon vision. In 1997, we came up with this vision that we are a socially responsible and environmentally conscious bread bakery in the Cass Quarter of Detroit that serves the businesses, residents, workers, and visitors of the neighborhood. So this vision was very important for us because in 1997, when we opened the bakery, Detroit was, in fact, a pretty dreary place. And Midtown, which we used to call Cass Corridor, and now they have branded Midtown, but we still call the Cass Corridor, um, was a little bit brief, a little bit drearier. So 12 years of very harsh economic federal policies had basically unraveled the social safety net for the most vulnerable. And a few more years of some very conservative state policies had basically dismantled them. And this in a neighborhood where we have a very high concentration of social service agencies. So the mental health institutions basically just overnight just shut down. And it was so bad the winter before we opened that one block south of us, there were 300 people sleeping outside in tents in the middle of the winter because there were so many homeless people that a church had to actually put up tents to be able to accommodate them. And yet, I could see this in my mind's eye. So does anyone here have Ann Arbor roots remember Wildflower Bakery? Anyone? So Wildflower Bakery was a great co-op bakery right next to the People's Food Co-op on 4th Avenue. And Annie and Paul were the founders. And I can see it right now. Annie with her long braid, her long skirt, chewing on fresh garlic first thing in the morning as the sun's coming up. And I remember thinking, now this is an honest way to make a living. But it wasn't like I was gonna make a living because I was very busy changing the world. I was protesting and in between, I would go to classes. <laughs> when I graduated from college, I moved to Detroit to follow the legendary Detroit activist James and Grace Boggs to follow their vision of rebuilding Detroit from the ground up. And when I got to know Detroit a little bit, I shopped at the Cass Corridor Food Co-op. Now this was a windowless building pretty much 2,000 square feet of cinder block that did a million dollars a year. I mean, this place was pretty funky and not so much in a good way, and yet there's people coming and going all the time, obviously pent up demand. And I wasn't a business person, but I could see that. Worse than that, or more than that, I was getting bread that was three days old. Why? Because it was from Wildflower Bakery in Ann Arbor, and they only delivered to Detroit two days a week. So I can see it right away. It's gonna be next to the co-op, just like in Ann Arbor, and it's gonna be an oasis in a world that's very challenging and sometimes very depressing. And even in, I think maybe what's a uniquely Detroit moment, I have a brainstorm while driving up the expressway, that this is gonna be called Avalon. So years later, when Avalon co-founder, Ann Peralt, and I are talking about starting a venture together, she says, okay, let's just do that bakery you always talk about. And Avalon was born. 
Now, Ann and I had a similar vision of Detroit. We saw a city where vacant land would be used to grow food for the people, where small businesses would emerge out of the community to meet their own needs. Our mentor, James Boggs, used to say, don't, it was just graduating from college, so it was great, don't wait for the man to, get your, to, to make your job. Bake your bread, fix your bike, fix your own shoes. So we took them literally. As we could see Avalon's role in this new Detroit as well, we would buy our produce from these wonderful gardens that were existing all over the city. But there's something very powerful and important about putting that vision into words. So the vision, a vision statement, and I, I really, even if you have been existing for 25 years and you don't have a vision statement, I really invite you to go back and create one. Because there's something very powerful about translating an inner vision that is, might just be one person, might be two, if you're a larger business, it might be a team of people, into an outer experience that can engage employees, stakeholders, and customers. Now the content may change. So we became a bread bakery that also serves sweets, and we also have lots of coffee, and now we do sandwiches, and now we do breakfast. But the vision, the overall vision, stays the same. So why is this important? I've always believed, and having a business has really made it clear to me that the clearer our intention, the clearer our outcome. So if we want to be a just and sustainable business, we need to say that. We need to put that on paper. And we need to make it to aim bright, to aim clear, to aim bold. It's our North Star, and so it keeps people on track. Not only, but especially when things are going hard, when things are going, going badly. So employees will show up for a job. Sure, it's a paycheck, but they'll sacrifice for a vision. And customers will pay for a product or service, but they'll promote a vision. And we were really lucky because we were still learning bread. We'd never been bakers before. We'd never been business owners. And what we discovered, to our great um, delight, is that customers will actually be willing to be much more forgiving of mistakes in the interest of a vision. Also, the vision is actually what attracted capital for us. So we weren't business owners, we weren't bakers, we had to figure out what we were doing, and we found out about a woman who was, a, was perfect for us. She was a business consultant that had been a marketing executive for Deloitte & Touche, and she now was a Buddhist, a Buddhist nun. Perfect. She even taught a class in Ann Arbor called Building a Business the Buddhist Way. And it was a 10-week class. And you know, as I look back on it now, I mean, we, didn't know, you know, we didn't know good or bad. But I mean, it was really, really great. Because she really just broke it down into these 10 stages. And at the end of it, we were all expected to have a business plan. There was a contest, and we won the contest. So we won our first $2,500 of startup capital, in large part because of the vision. And then the ball started rolling. Because then another Buddhist nun, whose mom had just passed and who'd left her a chunk of money that she and her daughter were going to buy a piano for her daughter, her and her daughter decided they were not going to buy a piano, but they were going to loan the money to us to buy our first oven. So we did, I just want to say, name the oven after Nana. So Nana is the oven that's in the front of the bakery still to this day. But our vision is also what allowed us to extend our community out to our friends and family. So I, I kind of need to explain here. The winter before, or the, the year and a half before we opened the bakery, I think Anna and I made $6,000 between the two of us in income. So we weren't really raking in the cash. I mean, we had a great life. We were living up in Traverse City for a little bit at a great place called Mania Tuan Inn, working in exchange, in, living in exchange for work. And so our quality of life was very high. Our income was very low. But we wrote a letter to our friends and family inspired by an example in, in uh, the East Coast in the Berkshire Mountains called Dolly Dollars. We wrote a, a note to 250 of our friends and family and colleagues and cohorts and um, other crazy people and said, we have this great idea. We're going to start an organic bread bakery in the middle of the Cass Quarter. And it's going to have three bottom lines. And we're going to invite you to do this with us. And we're going to invite you to send us between $5 and $500. And we'll send you bread dough, these little dollars, that you can then redeem in combination with some cash when you come to the bakery. 
within two weeks, we had $6,500 from about 50 friends and family. And then another group of women found out about us who were quietly loaning some small loans to women business owners, and we got another $10,000. So all this startup capital happened because we projected a bold vision. But the vision is what attracted people because suddenly we're more than a business. At our grand opening, and you gotta remember in 1997, there was almost no retail in Detroit. So people are going back and forth, thousands of people a day, tens of thousands of people a day are going back and forth to the hospital, to the DIA, to Wayne State, and not stopping to buy anything. And 700 people show up to our grand opening. We have dozens of volunteers. The neighborhood becomes our customers. I remember the uh, CEO of DMC was this really, really sharp woman who drove, drove a Porsche and wore just outrageously stylish clothes. And she pulls up one minute, and the next minute, Larry, the homeless guy who's lived outside our bakery since before we were there and is there to this day, they, were, they, they walked in the door right together, and I thought, <laughs> right on. So 700 people showed up because of our vision. The other thing is we got amazing press because of our vision. Now, when we opened up was when the Detroit Free Press, oops, the Detroit Free Press and the Detroit News um, were on strike. And we knew because of our vision we couldn't cross the picket line. We just weren't going to do it. And people said, how can you open a business without the major newspapers? And we're like, we have no idea. We'll see what happens. What happened? We got front page coverage in the Detroit Metro Times, the alternative weekly paper. And we got front page coverage in the, in, uh, the Sunday Journal, which was the Strikers weekly newspaper. Now, frankly, those front page stories were much more powerful than a story buried in the business section of the Free Press or News, because that was our demographic. Those people who encompass that vision, that would be the people who we would talk to. My favorite marketing book, is, I don't know if anyone has ever heard of him. Does anyone here ever heard of Seth Godin? Yeah, so the purple cow? Yeah, I, that's, that's like my Bible, which is good because it's like, <laughs> um, I, I like a small Bible. Um, and what, what he says, and, and it doesn't sound that revolutionary now because with the internet it kind of sounds second nature, but it's still very, very important. What he says is that, what he said 15 years ago, is that small businesses can't compete with large businesses based on your visual brand. So we cannot compete with Target's big red circles. We cannot compete with McDonald's golden arches, and we shouldn't try, we shouldn't even pay for that kind of advertising. How we compete is by doing something so exceptional that people remember it and want to talk about it. So, he, so why he calls it the purple cow is imagine you're driving down a country road, you see hundreds of cows, you're like cow, 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 and then all of a sudden you look and whoa, there's a purple cow. And so then you know you get on your phone, you're like, whoa, you should see this purple cow. And then the other person calls and says, there's this purple cow. So that becomes your viral base. Those become the people who sneeze out the information about you. So now people rely on Facebook, and, and while I think that's great, there is no replacement for old-fashioned viral marketing, where people say to me, to my face, this is so great, you've got to check it out. And as I look back, I realize our purple cow was our vision. It was something different. It made us exceptional. We also, I think, our vision allowed us to transcend some very important differences in race and class. I mean, let's be frank. This is an 88% African-American city over 50% of people live in poverty, and here are these two white women who grew up in the suburbs opening an organic bread bakery. Say what? And yet from day one, we have never received anything but love and support, and a lot of patience, as they teach us what we're supposed to know. Um, because people shared our vision. They knew we weren't there to colonize the neighborhood. They knew that we were not there to gentrify the neighborhood. They understood our vision, and they wanted to be part of their vision. And now that is our community. And that, insignificantly, the vision is what kept us going. Through 100-hour work weeks, as I'm sure many of you have had, through 110-degree nights baking bread, which I hope none of you have had. Um, and so the vision is critical in launching. So, but a vision without values is like a plot without characters. So vision is how we fit into the whole, and the values are who we are. They determine our culture, makes our brand, it's our soul. 
So according to the Buddhist principles of right livelihood, um, we kind of knew what our values were gonna be. Again, now these seem second nature, but in the mid 90s in Detroit, it seemed fairly revolutionary. And our values were what you can also call triple bottom line, earth, community, and employees. So earth. We had to start out with something that would be our line in the sand. We knew from the beginning there would be a ton of compromises. We're in a very economically mixed neighborhood. We cannot sell a cookie for four and a half dollars. It's just not gonna work. And if you used 100% organic ingredients, that's what you'd be doing. But we knew we had to draw a line in the sand of, over which we would not cross. And so we chose flour. It's our number one commodity. It also, although it's twice as expensive as conventional flour, it's a relatively inexpensive commodity. So we chose a commodity that we would buy a lot of and hopefully we would have an opportunity to impact a small segment of the organic economy and support the organic farmers. And I'm happy to report, much to our surprise, our distributor tells us that we are now the largest purchaser of organic bread flour in Michigan. And so we, we're kind of sick of it. And so we're, we've been supporting for 15 years these Mennonite farmers in Mirantel, Kansas that have been growing organic flour a whole lot longer than I've been around. But we're supporting them in their principles and their values. Interestingly, Dawn Foods, which is a national bakery distri distribution company but is based in Michigan, started to carry organic flour so they could service us. Now the organic ingredients are a big part of their business. So we able, just by doing the right thing, we were able, and staying focused, we were able to affect other businesses as well. So of course we use local products whenever possible. We use non-toxic cleaning products. And this is embarrassing, but in Detroit, recycling is a revolutionary act. The reason is because we have the only incinerator in the country, waste to energy incinerator, that's in the middle of a city, right in the middle of a city. So because the city was making money on it, burning waste into energy, it was actually illegal when we opened to do commercial recycling. But we're radicals. So we paid a customer who had a waste hauling business to <laughs> subterfuge to take our, uh, nobody was watching of course, but to take our, our recycling out to the suburbs to drop off at a recycling location. Now that customer, Matt Naimi, then kind of realized, well this is kind of a good idea, maybe other businesses want it too. Now Matt now has one of the fastest growing businesses in Detroit that's called Recycle Here, and an amazing business that he spun off once he started working with business of compostable um, disposable food products, so like you know cups and napkins and all that, and he has a very fast-growing business. So again, we were able to support another business in farming. So, but but the whole point is we started small. We started where we were. We're trying to change the world, but we can't change history. So we can only do things one small thing at a time. So right relationship with community. I heard that the workshop I heard on social equity, I mean, really nailed this, and I, I almost just wish I had her, <laughs> her, her uh, visual because it was so effective, but I'll give it a shot. Um, in Detroit, in some ways, community is the easiest because, quite frankly, it was such an underserved community when we arrived, and it still really is, that just providing something that was of use was right relationship with the community. So bread, sustenance, nutrition, it's relatively affordable, and if anything in the world is a symbol of a hearth or warmth or healing or nurturing, it's bread. So, so right there, we're giving to the community. But then, of course, we give back to the community in ways that every single business should give back to the community. Of course, we're giving back our leftover products. We're, give, we're giving back lots and lots of donations in kind and financial. And we've started over the years to really refine that. So now when we get, and we probably get, I don't know, 10 requests a week or something like that. And we just used to randomly go, this sounds good, no, that sounds bad. Or we don't have time to do this, this is too much. But now we have a matrix where we evaluate our, our three bottom lines and try to understand where the um, organizations, what is most clo closely aligned with our values. But it's also our marketing budget. We don't pay for advertising, we never have. So we also need to make sure that our demographic is knowing about what we're doing. So if a Catholic church in St. Clair Shores in the suburbs, they might be doing great work, 
but we're more likely to give to a small after-school program for at-risk youth because that's our community and quite frankly those are our customers um, so and then the other thing is just being on site people seeing us coming and going to work they knew we were working hard and they became part of our extended family so they mourned with us when I lost my mom when Anne lost her brother they celebrated with us when we had children and everywhere along the, the way, our lives became intertwined, sometimes a little much. Um, and we attracted other businesses. So it was never in our wildest dreams could I have imagined that we would have 15 businesses on our block that we do now. And it's amazing because those businesses were attracted to our block because they saw an example of a business that did good and did well. And they shared our values and they shared our vision and they wanted to be part of it. So a small clothing store and a gift store and now a little food market and they've all opened up and now we become a village and we call ourselves the Willis Village. In Detroit, again, unfortunately, there are not a lot of neighborhoods where African American owned and white owned businesses exist together. Our neighborhood is an exception. And so our community has developed, we have an annual uh, block party, we all share a common birthday and so we've developed into really um, sort of a hub and a model and it feels good for people to come there because it's the kind of world they all want to be part of. But I think the number one most important thing we can do for the community is provide exceptional customer service. The first workshop I ever went to um, was like some horrible Bakers Association conference, you know, in um, a huge conference in Chicago and it's super air conditioned and you're always freezing it's awful but I went to a little word I got nothing nothing out of it but I went um, you know they're trying to sell you this horrible food that isn't even food it's really bad but um, but I went to a workshop it was great it was called human marketing this guy had this revolution and we hadn't opened the business yet he had this revolutionary idea he was from Toronto he's like best kind of marketing is treat all your customers really really well I'm like yeah he's like no I mean really well and he gives an example of his store in Chicago it was a high-end clothing store and he's like you know people say please don't bring your children in here or don't let your children <laughs> touch the clothes and be like he had a playscape he had a cafe people could sit and eat he's like bring it on I want to be everything to you I want to treat you like gold and so he encouraged us you know things like he's like you know those signs where they say we only give change to paying customers he's like why like it costs you anything to give four quarters for a dollar. It's just good service. Or, you know, we only allow our, um, you know, only paid customers can use our bathroom. Really? Water's that expensive? Like we have a lot of homeless people in our neighborhood. Our bathroom is open. I mean, you know, sometimes you gotta be clear with people about what's okay and what's not okay. But frankly, most of the time, it's really not a problem. But mostly it's just good service to your community. I also, frankly, don't ask, I mean, we're small items at the bakery, you know, the average sales may be $10. So I don't even ask for ID when people, um, <laughs> when people use a, um, would, would write a check. Because frankly, what's it gonna do to see their ID? I mean, if it's gonna bounce, it's gonna bounce, you know, and then you just have to go through the process. And in the first 10 years when people used to actually write checks, we had maybe 10 checks that never bounced. So one of my um, heroes, and also our competitor is Zingerman's, which everyone knows. And they teach an exceptional course on customer service. Has anyone ever taken it? Yeah, it is. If you haven't, I highly recommend it. And if you have, you know what I'm talking about. And they taught a model that is so great that I'm going to quickly call it out here. So their steps to customer service are great, but their steps to how to handle a customer complaint is the number one most important thing I've learned in 15 years of doing business. So you're gonna to have to forgive me for a minute as I call it out. So, because I think it's an important part of building community. So first step is acknowledge the complaint. A customer comes up to you, there weren't enough chocolate chip cookies in my cookie. Okay, you could think that's really trivial, right? But if they didn't take their chocolate chip cookie seriously, my kids aren't going to college. So I better take their complaints seriously because they really care about how good chocolate chip cookies are. That's why they come to Avalon. So you meet them in the eye, you meet their level of passion. If they're really excited, you don't try to talk them down. You get, you get excited, you go, yeah, that's not okay, that's not okay. And if they're mellow, then you go chill. 
You make sure you understand what is their complaint. Sometimes it's even not even what they started with. It's something else. But you keep on working with them until you make sure, yeah, you got it. And you know when you got it. And then you look them in the eye and you sincerely apologize. You know, patronize them, like, I'm so sorry that happened, like my 11-year-old. Um, you know, like, I am really, really sorry that happened. That is not okay. And then you see what you do, anything you can do to make it right. And by anything, I mean any person in the business can do anything to make it right, no matter how big or small. Paul uh, Saginaw from Zingerman's gave the example. They will drive a pickle to Toledo. If someone calls and says, I got to Toledo with my sandwich and there was no pickle and I want my pickle, they'll be like, okay, where are you? So you give everyone the opportunity to do whatever you can to make it right. And here's the number one most important thing, 15 years of business, drum roll please, you thank the customer for bringing it to your attention. And that sometimes seems so hard because it seems so annoying that customers would complain to us. But really, who's annoying is the customers that go away and never tell us what we did wrong. And then talk bad about us and maybe even our moms and stuff like that. <laughs> so the customers who care enough to go face to face with us and say, you know what, you let me down. Those are our valuable customers. And those are the people you want to encourage them. Give me, here's my email address. You tell me any time it's not right. So right relationship with the community really begins and ends with customer service. Right relationship with the employees. A lot of people have talked about it today that I've heard and frankly I think might be doing a little better job than I'm doing. We call this spiritual boot camp. It really is a work in progress, and I think it's the hardest part of doing a business. In fact, someone once asked me, is management the hardest part of a business? And I said, no, it's the only hard part of a business. Everything else is more or less of a science, but wow, human management is really more of an art form. So of course, we're aspiring for good wages. You know, living wage is our goal. You know, we've always provided health insurance, um, paid time off, all that. But then there's some more other more subtle things like room to grow. So we don't bring in managers from the outside. We take hourly workers that we think are really good and we try to mentor them to become managers. And that comes with it its own set of contradictions. But these people, our managers, understand our business and understand their job better than anyone else. And their employees see them working really hard alongside them. The other really cool thing about this is that we have a much more diverse workforce and even more importantly, a much more diverse management force than most other businesses in our community. Because we're looking at a range of experience. We're not just looking at co what college you went to or what management job you had or what track you're on. We're looking at how do you work? How do you, how do you talk to people? And then we work and we mentor with people to bring them to the next level. We're present enough to set an example, but we get out of their hair a lot too, which I think is really important because Avalon's a really fun place to work in large part because employees make it fun. I mean, we're not always the most fun people in the world, you know, and, but they are. So they really, I think, make Avalon what it is. Um, but the, the hard things that I think I've learned that I'm still really working on is marketing's been a lot of what I've focused on and what I've learned after 15 years is really the most important marketing is the marketing we do to our employees. We really can't get our message out there if our employees aren't really remembering our vision, aren't really living our values, and don't really know what's going on day to day. And consistency and professionalism. We didn't have a human resource manual for 10 years. We just started one two years ago. And it's great because we got everyone's buy-in. But it is really important, of course, to have policies, mostly for the best employees, because they deserve to be treated fairly and not have all the attention going to the very few people who might not be doing their job. So vision, values, and evaluation. So we've got our plot, we've got our characters, but we don't have any pros. And I like to say without Anne, Avalon would be a great idea and we would have never baked a single loaf of bread. So Anne is the practical one. She's where the rubber hits the road. She makes sure things happen. She figured out how to actually bake bread every day, on time. And so making sure your products and services are, of course, as good as they can be, and you get the training and you get the resources you need is critical. You're, you should be your own, worst, your own harshest critic. You should be the one who is really looking to make sure it's right every day. 
But we had a, a great experience like our second year. We went to visit a bakery that we loved in uh, Sullivan, in Greenwich Village called Sullivan Street Bakery. And this guy's like super cocky, you know, and like baked in cowboy boots and was just making, I mean, he's just doing so well in this little itty bitty spot in Greenwich Village. And he's burning his bread, I'm not kidding you not. He's serving burned bread. It tastes really good, but it's burned. And we're like, man, how did you learn how to do what you do? I mean, did you go to a baking school? Did you hire a fancy consultant? Like, what did you do? And he goes, you know how I learned how to be such a good baker? And we're like, no, how? And he goes, I baked a lot of bad bread. So you got to bake a lot of bad bread. That's part of what business is. And you got to pick yourself up. And then you got to figure out what you did wrong. And then you got to move on. Marketing is the same thing. It really is trial and error. I'm wearing our Detroit Lovers shirt, which has become our super popular campaign. We sold thousands of these shirts. It just happened randomly. I did some Valentine's Day campaign. I said, let's, let's focus on our love of Detroit and blah, blah, blah. And then pretty soon, we couldn't keep these in stock. And so then that, that becomes a big part of our brand. So you're constantly evaluating what's catching on. And it isn't necessarily the things you think are the greatest but you're paying attention to what the customers, what's resonating with the customers. Of course, now online, it's so great to have all these evaluation tools because you can see how many click-throughs, you know, how many Facebook hits, that's all great. But at the end of the day, you gotta know what's selling and what's not. But the most important evaluation tool that I've learned is open book management. So who here has heard of or read the book, um, The Great Game of Business by Jack Stack? So, I highly recommend it. It's a little thicker than this, but not so thick as this. This guy a, is a business owner who actually worked for a business that failed, and then he and some of the workers bought the business, took it over, and he was a big sports fan. And so here's what he says. He says, you know, if you're playing football and there's no uh, scoreboard, there's no end zone, and no one knows the rules, it's really hard to get people to run really, really fast and throw the ball hard. And so like in a business, a lot of times as business owners, we're running around, we're all stressed out, cost of goods are too high, oh my God, we, our sales are really low last week. Nobody knows what even we're worried about. So we have something, a scoreboard for everyone to see and everyone in the, in the bakery knows costs of goods sold plus labor, I mean um, ingredients plus labor equals cost of goods sold. And everyone knows what it needs to be for us to be able to cover our bottom line. And it goes up every single week. We know how much bread, we know how much sweets, we know how much wholesale, we know how much retail. And that way it's totally transparent. So we share the stress and we share the glory. <coughs> it isn't only used though for financial. You can also gauge other things like let's say you're working on number of on-time evaluations. Um, and so you might say we only had 50% of our evaluations on time this month. Next month, it's 60%. Next month, it's 70%. So you can gauge a lot of different things. So you got your vision. You got your values. You're evaluating. So in like 2003, we're like, cool. We got it. We figured it out. We kind of accomplished our goals. Now what? And so at that point, we have to revision because we really, business is the art of the possible. We're constantly reinventing ourselves if we're doing our job well. And I think we've heard some interesting examples of that actually today. So we worked with our staff in 2003 to project a strategic plan that took us five years out. I'm not gonna share my entire strategic plan with you, don't worry. But what I, what I would like to do is share the vision that our staff helped us create. It said, bread is the staff of life, a symbol of health, sustenance, and everyday revolution of the spirit. Avalon International Bread seeks to bring these metaphors to life through the act of making your daily bread. It is our highest aspiration that every person's life is enhanced, inspired, and in some way healed by their interaction with Avalon. This includes employees, customers, vendors, and members of the immediate community. Moreover, we seek to act in ways that affirm our interconnectedness with the living planet and all its beings. In this process, we become whole. So we had to continue to look ahead, continue to change our vision. It has to be somewhere we haven't arrived at yet. I think we're probably good for a while on that one. Because our reality is always changing. After I had my first child, I remember just saying to my dad, you know, it's not that the bakeries become less important, but something else has become way more important. 
So at that point, we adopted open book management, we recommitted to zero waste, we decided to really focus on quality control, and we hired the right professionals to help us make the next move. I am really indebted to one of the founders of Zingerman's. I'm not a stockholder in Zingerman's. You must think I am. I'm not. I'm a competitor. Um, but one of the founders of Zingerman's is Paul Saginaw. He is fondly referred to within the company as the CSO, the Chief Spiritual Officer. And Paul and I didn't know each other. We knew of each other. But I called him because Anne and I had gone through a personal shift in our lives, and we were about to go through this huge expansion. And I went to Paul and said, I need you to help me figure out what's the right structure for this business. And I brought all our financials and our strategic plan. Paul wouldn't. He, he listened. I cried. Of course, I cried. He, he was cool. And then he goes, all right, we're not even talking about the business. I got homework for you. Go home and write your vision for your life in five years. What do you want it to look like? And I was like, Oh, God, this is something really hard, and it was. And by doing that, he helped me realize, and because you also have to realize if you're the right person to take your business to the next level. In my case, I realized I wasn't. And this was a good time for me to focus on the other things in my life that I'd really been interested in. And Anne was. And so she retooled her life to become the CEO and to take us to the next level. So the Avalon revision now is that we have the same vision and values. We have, we're gonna have a new manufacturing facility in a neighborhood that has not been developed at all. We're gonna have new retail in Detroit. We're gonna have new partnerships that are gonna provide more jobs and more resources and hopefully extend the Avalon vision to a larger number of people. We also recently, just last week, got named one of the 50 um, Michigan businesses to look out for. And I think they meant that in a good way. <laughs> so I'm summing it up now. But I've been blessed in many ways. I grew up in the 1970s in suburban Detroit. And I know it only benefited from the privileges of a family that was educated, that was entrepreneurial, that had a strong sense of community. But I was also blessed with the ability from a very early age to understand the contradictions between my life in a leafy green suburb all white community and the reality of the majority of the people in my community that live 30 miles south of me. I remember it like it was yesterday, driving down the Lodge Freeway, looking at the abandoned buildings, looking at the um, burned out buildings, and I asked my dad, you know, explain this to me. And my parents were basically liberal, but I have no idea what they said, because whatever it was, it didn't ring true. And so I set out on my own path to right the wrongs that brought me my privilege and to put my life to use to make it right. And it brought me here in 1985, walking across the state with the Michigan Peace March, and it brought me back here today. And so 20 years ago, when I moved to Detroit, I helped organize a youth movement called Detroit Summer to rebuild, respirit, renew Detroit from the ground up. And I could never have envisioned that Avalon would be a business that would be part of a flourishing community of over 1,600 gardens, producing 160 tons of organic produce every year. They'd be part of dozens of nonprofits and businesses that are helping to rebuild our food, make a more sustainable food system. But through vision, values, evaluation, and re-envisioning, Avalon is one of many businesses, organizations, and individuals that's making a more just, sustainable Detroit. A local first has 600 businesses with a common vision and values. I know you have the right tools. So I can only imagine that you're already creating a more just and sustainable world, one West Michigan business at a time. Jackie, so Hi. could you uh, say something about marketing to, to internally, that, that, that internal branding that you were talking about? So, when, you know those, those 1950s things of the women, you know, like I knew I should, I forgot to have children, you know, those kind of funny cartoons. One says, if I can't be a shining example, let me be a terrible morning. So um, I can tell you what we did wrong. Um, no, I mean, I think that 
I'm kind of in a unique position because I went from, you know, basically running the country to then, the country, no, <laughs> company. I thought I was running the country. I didn't know why it wasn't going better. Um, to, to just working on marketing for a number of reasons. Um, and what I learned really by kind of not getting it right is if I'm not in front of the staff on a really regular basis, selling with them even to some extent, but also working with them to find out what's in their hearts and minds, what are their ideas, then, um, or at least giving them a very, I, mean, I think you said, are you the one who said that every day you meet with your staff? Yeah, well, like you're doing it. I mean, part of it's just that. It's just good, basic communication to your staff so they hear from you every day what's going through your head so that when big campaigns come up, they, it isn't a total surprise. Um, and when good things happen, there's been a lead up. And when bad things happen, they're kind of as prepared as you are. So some of it, I think, is really just communication. And I think that can be, I think probably the best is in person, but I think that can be newsletters. I think it can be an employee Facebook page. I think you cannot, I'm pretty sure, you can't over-communicate with your employees. Um, so is that just, and, and I don't think it has to be fancy. You don't have to have big campaigns around it. I think it's just good, like, human marketing to your employees. Well, thank you for coming here and, and uh, for all your accomplishments. Could you comment on, one, the, the health of your, cons your customers and how that's, your, your, your provisions, how they've benefited your community. And also, could you comment on the D uh, Detroit City of Hope and maybe the Catherine Ferguson School? Mm, sure. Um, so, the, the health of our, um, of our customers. Um, so, when we started the business, we thought, um, I mean, I laugh, it's not funny. But um, we thought, well, we're only going to make things with 100% whole wheat flour because that's the healthiest option. And then we started actually baking, and we realized nobody wants to eat stuff with 100% whole wheat flour. I mean, it's great. Everyone says they want to. Nobody wants to. So we decided, you know, there were certain things that we were going to allow choices about, and there are certain things we weren't. So, for instance, I remember my dad saying, you have to allow a choice. You have to have either organic bread for $3 a loaf or non-organic bread for, you know, 99 cents a loaf. And I'm like, Dad, people have a choice. They can buy our bread that's organic for $3 a loaf, or they can go anywhere else and buy non-organic bread for 99 cents a loaf. So there's some ways in which we're not going to offer a choice. But then there's other places that we're going to offer choices. And um, I think in the interest of being a hearth and a gathering place, having a wide variety of food with a wide variety of nutritional value is part of that. So for instance, we have some amazing vegan, um, well, all our bread is you know, really as healthy as bread can be essentially, except some, it's made with some white flour, but no fats, no you know, sugars, all that. Um, but our vegan stuff, some of our vegan stuff is really stunning and is you know, really quite healthy. And then we have our best selling item, which is our sea salt chocolate chip cookie. So, you know, I mean, if we only had vegan products, you know, in an herbal tea in the cast corridor, not only would we not do, do well, I think people would hate us. So, you know, I mean, we, you know, you know, there's a reason why our grandmas used to, you know, bake, you know, oatmeal raisin cookies and didn't like just go, here's your bowl of gruel for when you come home from school. So, you know, I think big part of being a hearth and being loving and nurturing is, is out allowing choice. I think one place we could do a lot better, one thing I would like to see us do better, and actually Whole Foods has a very interesting program right now, um, is measuring nutrient density. And so educating people more about what foods have more nutrients. And I think we could do a lot better job than that, and that's just a matter of um, resources that we apply to it, of when we're allowing people choice, that they know what the choices are. Um, I think in general, our customers have pretty good health um, because they're the ones who choose the organic um, products, so it's almost like a self-fulfilling you know, fulfilling kind of thing. Sometimes I take sticky buns away from people I've been known to do that. I'm like, you shouldn't eat that every day. That's a once a week product. Um, as I said, our customers are very forgiving. Um, but Catherine Ferguson Academy, City of Hope, so the Bog Center, James and Grace Boggs, these legendary activists, now Grace has become an international hero. She's 95 and is in Atlanta today speaking. She was just on a panel with Angela Davis in California two weeks ago. She's amazing. Um, but the City of Hope is just one of the incarnations of the Boggs Center, which is looking at new ways of empowering community activists 
to rebuild their neighborhoods and to rebuild relationships. And I think City of Hope is one incarnation. We're having a 20th anniversary celebration of Detroit summer. This summer, we're volunteers and youth are going to be coming from all over the country to work in Detroit. And so we're just always looking at new grassroots um, ways of, um, of connecting, really. Very small ways and ways that aren't so small. Um, Catherine Ferguson Academy is a fabulous public school that um, was servicing um, pregnant uh, teens and girls with uh, teenagers with children and the science teacher who's a friend of mine Paul Wirtz created this very innovative science program and essentially he made the school into a farm and so it's this awesome awesome resource in our community um, where girls learn about biology botany um, science nutrition everything through actually working in the garden and working with animals and the community's gotten very involved with it as well it almost closed down and then it became a charter school which you know, it's better than it not being there, um, but it's one of the examples of really, really great community building um, in our in our city. We have time for one more question. All right, thank you so much, Jackie. Thank you. Another Thanks so much.